Once a fan becomes loyal to a team, researchers from Harvard University and other acclaimed colleges have found that fans tend to feel as if it's their duty to celebrate or protest on the team's behalf after an intense game, similar to how one feels the need to defend their own family. These researchers have also found that sports riots take place due to the tendency of fans to associate their own self-worth with the performance of the team they support, as stated by the Washington Post. As a result of this personalization, the team becomes an extension of the fan. So when a fan supported team loses, it feels like an attack on themselves. Okay. So here's the thing. Okay, so we got work to do. We got work to do. We got work to do. And I love that there is so much enthusiasm. But let's talk about the work we got to do. Because we've got 11 days to see this through, and we will win. We will win. We will win. And we will win, and we will win because we know and understand what is at stake. We are 11 days out from an election that will decide the future of America including the freedom of every woman to make decisions about her own body and her reproductive freedom. And everyone here tonight is here because we are about fighting for our future and not letting some people take us back. Because we are not going back. We are not going back. She didn't show up. 
She wouldn't be there, she said no. And she ended up doing a tape that was pathetic, and it was an insult to Catholics, frankly, because she was actually sort of knocking them or knocking religion. Then she had the other event the other day where she said, you're in the wrong location, when they started talking about a certain subject, right? They were in the, which basically was a knock on Christianity and a knock on religion, because she doesn't know what the hell she's saying. But there had been a failure, it's been a disaster, or you're going to have four years, and they will be the four greatest years in the history of our country if we make the proper decision and better make that decision. Have we really relegated the process of electing our highest office to the hysteria of like a some kind of sports frenzy? The state of things has gotten a little silly. So I asked ChatGPT to give us some help, <laughs> to give me some help with this. To understanding this. I was like, how do children or what advice do we usually give children about playing fair or, you know, handling losses maturely, graciously? Let me pull up that, pull up that chat and see, you know, what chat GPT suggests since we are in the age of AI. Let's see. Remember, this is how, this is based on the advice that we're giving to children. This is what we need to do as adults after the end of this countdown here that we're seeing. All right, let's talk about one of the big hot topics right now with Roe versus Wade. I asked ChatGPT to elaborate on what was meant by the case hinted at the darker side of Hollywood's power dynamics. The Hollywood studio system already forming at the time had a reputation for controlling stars' images and managing scandals to protect their most profitable figures or to finance them is what's coming out in today's case. And it's also coming full circle also with the Menendez case and from the mouths of computers. This is groundbreaking, right? This is amazing. Let's see, here we go, here's my question. What is common advice given to children about playing fairly and accepting losses with maturity and grace? AI wisely says, advice to children on playing fairly and accepting losses gracefully often focuses on teaching respect, resilience, and empathy. We need respect, we need resilience, and we need empathy. Here are some common pieces of advice. Number one, follow the rules. <laughs> Encourage kids to play by the rules, emphasizing that they help ensure a fair and enjoyable experience for everyone fair and enjoyable experience for everyone. Two, winning isn't everything. Emphasize that games are more about having fun, learning, and bonding than winning. This helps kids put the game in perspective. Winning isn't everything. Another perspective that would be helpful is the scope of things. An election here is the choosing of someone to represent us for four years, not eternity. I'm just gonna, we'll get to that later though. Four years. Three, be happy for others. Remind them to congratulate others when they win, which builds empathy and mutual respect. Four, learn from losing. Teach kids to see losses as learning opportunities. They can think about what went well and what they can improve, which helps them grow. Five, stay calm and positive. Encourage children to take deep breaths and remain calm if they're feeling frustrated or upset about a loss. Six, focus on the effort, not the result. Praise their hard work and teamwork instead of just the outcome, which builds resilience and self-worth beyond winning. This self-worth piece is super interesting because it comes into play with sports craze and mob mentalities and mania and things like that. Seven, remember how others feel. I love this one. This one's great for the kids and for the adults. Kids should treat others the way they'd like to be treated, reinforcing the idea that everyone deserves kindness, win or lose. These lessons can make games and competitions more meaningful, shaping a child's approach to both winning and losing with maturity. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> what else do we have here for some context? 
here, I think AI, I always love to be polite to the AI and look how sweet they are. You're very welcome. Let me know if there's anything else I can help with. Um, I have some things about constitutional rights being overturned. Can they be reinstated? Yes. Yes, this is not the end of the world. Okay, permanent ways to prepare. Then we talk about constitutional amendments. Yes, here we go. One of the things, like the big, um, it's like educate yourself. Things can change. This isn't the end. Figure it out. All right, let's talk about one of the big hot topics right now with Roe versus Wade, right? So Roe versus Wade was a landmark 1973 Supreme Court case in which the court ruled that the Constitution protects a woman's right to choose to have an abortion, at least in the early stages of pregnancy. This decision based on the right to privacy under the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment significantly changed abortion laws across the United States, striking down many federal and state abortion restrictions. So this changed laws that struck down federal and state restrictions. So we were already here where we are in this, the big precipice of where everybody's like on edge and super angry and super angsty. Like this is where we were in 1973. This is just over 50 years ago, 51 years ago to be exact. This isn't like we've lived a life before this and there will be a life after this, no matter which way that it goes. And the, the at the end of the day, if a decision can be overturned in one direction, this is proof positive that it can be overturned in the other direction in the future. If we behave, if we take the advice that we give our children to behave maturely, look at the situation squarely, remain calm, figure out where we can go next. And then I'm going to later ask the kind AI to apply the situation and the advice that it gives to children to adults, and we'll see what it tells us to do. So again, the background for the case, it was brought by Jane Rowe, a pseudonym for Norma McCorvey, a Texas woman who challenged Texas laws that made abortion illegal, except to save a mother's life. So this is the, was the state of things in 1973. Rowe argued that these laws infringed on her right to privacy and freedom to make medical decisions about her own body. In a 7-2 decision, the Supreme Court ruled that the right to privacy, though not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution, was broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. This right to privacy was interpreted as stemming from the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. They it established a framework for pregnancy trimesters. The impact. Roe v. Wade effectively legalized abortion nationwide and provided guidelines for states on regulating the procedure. It became a central point in discussion about reproductive rights, women's autonomy, and medical ethics. And then we say overturning of Roe v. Wade. In 2022, the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade with the case Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, ruling that there is no constitutional right to abortion. That's all that was ruled. There's no constitutional right to an abortion. This decision returned to the returned the power to the right to regulate abortion to individual states, which led to a mix of new laws, some states protecting access while others moved to restrict or ban it. The overturning of Roe v. Wade marked a significant shift in American law and spurred widespread legal and societal debate over reproductive rights and the role of federal versus state authority in personal health care decisions. Nevertheless, we were on one side of the, the equation and then we went to another, similar to an election, where we might move from one side to another. And then in time, we might move back based on the outcome and the set of circumstances and the lived experience of the people in that time in reaction to the decisions that were made. So if we go a direction that we don't like, we're going to live that and that is going to inform our future decisions and what happens later. It's not set in stone. This isn't the end. This isn't the ultimate end all be all of a frenzy that we have to get into. Because when we move into that kind of mindset, moving away from logic, we go into the hysteria of that mob mentality that creates outcomes that are not favorable to anyone because it just causes more angst and more conflict and more division and more irrationality. This, we've been here before. And if we continue to do the same things, we're going to be here again. So I think also this needs to look at the underlying issues. Some of the things that people talk about that were really pain points in this is the right to choose when someone has been um, sexually harmed or assaulted. And that is a whole nother piece of the pie of how we handle sexual assault and exploitation in this country. And there's a lot of huge stuff going on right now. We look at the cases of our entertainment industry moguls, and we also look at the, the case coming to term for the Menendez brothers. All of these things are issues that have been in place for a long time that no one wants to speak about or dig deeper into, um, but people are wanting to now. So it's just how long do we go as a society before we make the change that shifts society in the way that creates the actual outcomes that we want to see perpetuated? Is Are we like legalizing the symptom rather than the cause? And things like that are interesting to discuss. I went on to have a conversation with the AI about the earliest reported cases of sexual abuse related to the casting couch in Hollywood following that thread of the main cases that are going on right now.
in the entertainment industry. So this was also super interesting. The casting couch phenomenon where aspiring actors or actresses, and this also applies to the music industry. It also applies to, um, you know, across the board in the entertainment industry are pressured into sexual activity by powerful figures in exchange for career advancement has deep and troubling roots in Hollywood. This practice was rumored to be common in the film industry as early as the 1920s, right around Hollywood's golden age. So when we talk about the 51 years it took to go right back to the same place with, you know, Roe v. Wade, we're looking at a major public case with, um, the, within the rap industry right now with, you know, some of the factors and things that have been in place over a hundred hundred years ago. So this is a hundred years in the making where we haven't put an end to this issue. But then we're still, you know, handling it as a one, one, like one off incident with each person that goes, you know, to court, goes to trial on these things. But let's look at the facts of this case that it brings up as the earliest side of case in Hollywood and how that, uh, or in the film industry. And it's very interesting to me that it brought up some of these things like a, attending a party. So, this stuff is not, not, there's nothing new under the sun, but we need to address the issue, the, the cause, and not get swept up into the symptoms and feel like we are solving the major issues by getting so riled up and in a frenzy, you know, at these four-year precipice, you know, at these four-year decision points. Like, are we still making big movements? Since I've been eligible to vote, I don't feel like I've seen major shifts on these main issues that affect me personally in terms of the things that I see that have been harmful and detrimental to our society, which are these kinds of insidious things that are like leaking beliefs to surface or the things with our economy, which is another thing that's a main point of this election with taxes and spending and who's going to do what and how are we going to handle inflation and all this stuff. And it's like great books like this that I'm, I was invited to join a book club and they were reading The Creature from Jekyll Island. And so I was able to pull up my old copy. This is one of the first books that I read that really freaking woke me up, you know, along with Confessions of an Economic Hitman in the beginning stages of being like, hey, people can lie to us, people that you trust can lie to you. People that you trust to be in their place as an official, as a respected official, can lie to you in, in order to protect their interests. It's funny because that had to become something that I was aware, made aware of. And that's something that everybody would likely need to be made aware of before they start to really see that these situations, like this case here, is not like a one-off situation, but maybe a more insidious thing or something based on something that we're not really getting to the root of because we keep hacking away at the symptoms. And this book, uh, G. Edward Griffin, The Creature from Jekyll Island, he does an excellent job of like saying, hey, uh, everybody's getting mad about taxes and people and candidates that are, you know, threatening to impose, impose taxes on the people, but they don't know that the actual nature of the monetary system and how it was designed and orchestrated in secret by a group of bankers that went off in disguises and fake names and went off to a, an island, similar to how we know about certain people having islands and going off to do certain nefarious acts off on their islands when they have a lot of money. This was similar. All of the bankers, or six bankers that rep represented about a quarter of the whole world's wealth, met in secret on an island called Jekyll Island, and they were all heavily you know, they led these banking institutions and these financial institutions to agree on a bill or a structure that they wanted to pass to move into law of the United States so that they could have the advantage. And that G. Edward Griffin says that when people are outraged about, you know, taxing and inflation and we're like pushing these candidates, like, what are you going to do about this? You know, they don't realize that the system is creating the issue and that you're being taxed regardless because the system is designed to print money, fiat currency out of thin air. And that practice alone over time deflates the value of the dollar which creates a higher cost point for purchasing goods and things and so when you have someone that's standing on their podium that says hey i am going to make sure that i don't tax people Edward Griff <laughs> griffin poses the question of like but we're still being taxed though because the outcome of that original act that meeting on jekyll island that was done in secret because they said that there was no way that the american people would allow what they call a banking cartel to create the rules for the future of the economic system it's exactly what happened and we're dealing with that and it, as long as that's not understood or addressed then all this other stuff is just kind of like a what do they call it the kansas city shuffle bruce bruce willis mentions in that movie the kansas city shuffle you look this way while i go this way and then you can get around and accomplish what you wanted to accomplish without people really ever getting to the source so let's read this one of the earliest well-documented cases related to the casting couch involves Virginia Rapp, a young actress whose 1921 death led to a sensational scandal. She died after attending a party hosted by silent film star Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. And while Arbuckle was later acquitted 
of manslaughter, the case hinted at the darker side of Hollywood's power dynamics. Another early documented case involves Clara Bow, a famous it girl of the 1920s. Bow later spoke about her exploitation by film executives and other men in power. She shared that she and other young actresses were often subjected to coercion and harassment, suggesting that such behaviors were systemic, even in the industry's early years. This goes on. An MGM studio head rumored to exploit his position. The concept of the casting couch and related abuses stayed largely hidden until more recent movements like Me Too began to bring these stories to light, revealing the historical and pervasive nature of the problem. But again, we continue to be um, addressing the symptom case by case. R. Kelly, P. Diddy, so-and-so, Weinstein, all this stuff. Why don't we address the actual bigger issue? I think that's what we're moving towards slowly but surely. But yeah, this isn't the, this has been going on since the 20s in this particular instance. Again, the Jekyll Island meeting, I don't know what year that was. Let's see. This is a great book. It's written in very easy to follow layman's terms and, and really interesting. 1910, 1910, okay. So I asked ChatGPT to elaborate on what was meant by the case hinted at the darker side of Hollywood's power dynamics. The Virginia rap case in 1921 revealed the extent to which power imbalances in Hollywood could lead to exploitation, secrecy, and even public scandal. Here's how it hinted at Hollywood's darker power dynamics. Number one, party culture and exploitation. This is huge. Virginia Rapp was a young actress with aspirations in Hollywood, a common profile of someone hoping to rise in the entertainment industry. The incident occurred at a party hosted by Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, one of the most successful silent film stars of the time. Rapp's death and the rumors of what transpired at the party brought public attention to how powerful industry figures could use their status and resources to manipulate or take advantage of more vulnerable individuals in the industry. Number two, media sensationalism and image management. Huge. The Hollywood studio system already forming at the time had a reputation for controlling stars' images and managing scandals to protect their most profitable figures or to finance them is what's coming out in today's case. And it's also coming full circle also with the Menendez case and that's loosely related, but I did, I started watching that Netflix documentary. I couldn't get through the whole thing. It was just horrible, but I mean, it's like episode five or six, I think. But the mention of the dad being involved in the entertainment industry and the, uh, the music industry and just the ideas, you know, of just the fact that he was, you know, this is from 1989, that case or around that time. So People should know more or less without a spoiler, but I don't think it's a spoiler because again, that's what felt kind of sick to me is watching it. Like this is not entertainment. I was watching it because I heard that they were going to be up for um, some sort of re-examination of their life sentence to possibly be released right now. And I was like, who are these people? Why are we calling them monsters? And who is about to be released back into our society? So let me figure out what this is. And I watched some of the documentary for that purpose. But when I feel like, like it, it just seemed wrong to watch or, or felt wrong to, to continue to, to watch that as like a sensationalized or entertainment thing because, you know, how it kind of bordered what's going on also with the other major entertainment case right now. It's just like this stuff is, you know, going on because it's allowed to go on for a lot of reasons. And we need to kind of get to the root again, taking off our team, you know, loyalty and rah, rah about which side is going to win and, and going into shambles and, and shooting people and, and doing all this crazy stuff because we're not liking another person's opinion. Like let's focus on the actual thing. These people are not really, you know, figureheads of doing things that are moving things phenomenally forward. It's the people who elect them who are responsible for moving society forward, for challenging them to address the issues that impact society in a major way. And again, it's not just whatever that promise is for that, that campaign and the results of that, because that's going to last for four years. And we've seen the tide shift from side to side. In my lifetime, I've seen it shift from one side to the other side several times. And I haven't seen some of these, again, deep-seated systemic things change on either side. We need to figure out why that's happening and move that conversation forward. Study like the root cause of things, the, the history of situations, how pervasive is a thing? Is there a, is a thing behind the thing that's allowing the thing that we don't want to continue to happen? And we need to move forward that conversation rather than you know, paint our faces the color of whatever party we are and just get so incensed to be like, oh, our person has got to win or else everything is doomed. It's like, no, this is going to last four years. And then 50 years from now, 100 years from now, we're going to look at the big picture and see that, hey, did we really actually move anywhere or are we going in circles just like with the issue of the Roe v. Wade argument and whether you agree with it or not it's just the facts that we have gone in a circle we've been here before 
and we've gotten to where we are. And if where we are is what you think was right, then take heart in knowing that if things don't go your way in the next four years, we can shift to another way. Again, there's time. We have nothing but time, but it's our responsibility to decide what we do with that time. When we get to asking our lovely chat GPT about how adults should handle loss with maturity and grace after an election, it's going to tell us some great stuff, which is like, why don't we already know this? It's because we're acting like this is a, a, a game of, you know, high stakes, like we're betting on some kind of a sports event rather than realizing that, hey, life goes on after this, you know, and that's what this is really about. It's not about like game day and, and getting so crazy that we like go into a mob or a riot, which is something that I'm going to look at as well. But it's just like, come on, this is this is a lot of media sensationalism. So here, back to this, the Hollywood studio system already forming at that time had a reputation for controlling stars' images and managing scandals to protect their most profitable figures. In the case of Arbuckle, he initially received support from his studio, which tried to protect his career from the scandal. This response hinted at how studios and other industry entities might prioritize their stars' public image and reputations over accountability, highlighting a system that valued profit over justice. So this is one of the issues, societal issues that we should be addressing. How many of our systems value profit over justice? And what can we do to stop that or to fix that? So I mean, that's something that these are things that I would like, you know, us to be debating over and having candidates speak on and to address and correct is the things that have been happening or that are not changing from year to year, you know, from candidate to candidate, you know, four years at a time. Like, why can't we move the needle on these things? Like, why can't we fix these things? I think we're, I think a lot of people are a little bit at least in my generation, a little bit tired of the charade. It's just a farce at this point. So we need to get deeper. Like, how can we handle? Yeah, I've already said it, but <laughs> back to it. Legal and societal immunity of powerful figures. Arbuckle's trial, which included three separate trials before he was ultimately acquitted, illustrated how powerful men in Hollywood often enjoyed significant protection and legal resources. I think I was mentioning that too, that this is the casting couch and all the stuff that we're seeing and what's coming out right now with the trial to come um, for the hip hop industry is that we're saying that this is not just about women being victimized. And just like with the Menendez case, it highlighted that men are being victimized as well, very much so. And like, what can we do to just recognize that first and foremost and then to address it and a lot of other things also with that like the fact that we're using guns and drugs and all this stuff and this is entertainment why are we involved in criminal activity when we're entertaining these things are do not go hand in hand there these protections should not reach that far and one of the questions that i ask and follow up to this are why are why is this being allowed to happen because there's this idea that one of the things that we are doing is protecting us i'm speaking from these industry mindsets it's like we're protected because we had you do something before you entered that party what was that? You signed something, right? And this common like commentary that I keep hearing is just driving me crazy because I hear people acting like this is this is literally factual, like that you can protect certain actions by signing an agreement to not disclose. Like that's a that's a major mis misconception, and that's something that I I hope um, comes to light as well through this. What we're going to see playing out in the next year or so when this come this next this next cycle repeats itself. Um, but when in the time that it's happening is why it, it has a different outcome. So again, we're going to see what happens with the outcome of the Roe v. Wade situation in the, I think it was Jackson, in, the, in 2022. We're going to see how that outcome impacts the people who are living in that time. And we're going to hopefully make a decision that we as a people want to see moving forward. Or we're going to see as a people how the impact of our fervor right now is or isn't right with how it impacts us down the line. And so all of these actions are about testing out societal structures and dynamics in order for us to live in a way that we want to live. And if we don't like the way we live, hey, democracy says we can change that. So the main issue where people are getting riled up is are we losing that sense of democracy where we're not going to have another four years where it's going to be this ultimate dictatorship and whatnot. And I guess with one candidate that we're asking that about, I just look back to the time when they were already they already did this thing four years ago. And I'm like, I, I think we're still doing this, you know, eight years later. So that to me deflates that argument. But over time, more and more and more, if we see our constitutional rights on the individual level being peeled back and taken back, free speech and the rights to protect ourselves with certain things, all of those things, when that goes away, that's more of something that sparks my attention. And it's like, okay, do we have an issue there? Like, are we slowly but surely 
chiseling away the fundamental foundations and freedoms that we protected that made this country what it is. But yet and still, hey, we need to, if we're the ones voting, we're the ones creating and shaping this. If we see that, it's our duty to work to move back and towards what we value and what we find is suitable to us. It's not about like, again, raw, raw paint our face one color and we're just there for the day and we just want our side to win. And then after they don't just, ah, oh, next year, we're going to just blame, hey, look what you did all the last four years. You ruined everything. I'm like, that's, that's very, very like pointless and very uh, juvenile. And again, we remember the advice that we give to children about handling wins and losses. Again, it's not about just that day and that win and that loss and then blaming the next four years on, on the person, on the fact that we didn't, our side didn't win. It was about getting to the fundamentals and getting involved, taking an active stance. And again, that's going to tell us that our, our lovely AI, when it tells us how adults should handle losses after an election. But first, wrapping this up, um, legal and social immunity for public figures. I think I've address that systemic silence and victim blaming public sentiment and courtroom arguments at the time often shifted the blame onto rap shifting the blame onto the victim is interesting questioning her character and lifestyle despite her tragic death this mirrored a wider pattern in which victims particularly women were discouraged discouraged from speaking out due to the threat of social backlash or career damaging consequences the case thus exposed the stigma and challenges victims faced if they sought to challenge powerful industry figures so that's another thing what do we need to address we need to address the stigma and challenges victims face when seeking to challenge powerful industry figures. These these things that are stacked up to protect criminal activity are what need to be addressed and what need to be changed. The rap Arbuckle scandal highlighted the lack of accountability mechanisms in Hollywood and foreshadowed decades of systemic issues where power, fame, and exploitation intersected, often with impunity for those in positions of authority. It became one of the first indicators that the casting couch culture and a, bright, and a broader culture of abuse had likely taken hold in Hollywood from its early years. Again, it's 1920. Elaborate can you elaborate specifically on what was rumored to have transpired at the industry party described above? And it says, the incident involving Virginia Rapp at the party hosted by Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle in 1921 has several key elements that contributed to the scandal, much of which remains rooted in rumor and speculation due to the lack of clear evidence. Here's a more detailed look at what was rumored to have transpired. The party set up. The party took place at the St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco, public place. So this is interesting, again, how these things mirror to, to right now, 2024, and, and asking deeper questions like, okay, what are these hotels that are involved in witnessing certain things? And then having possession of evidence of certain things and then not reporting that. The issue of people not reporting is another thing that is a societal question that we need to, to correct and address. It's like, is it, we'll get into that in the years to come. I'm sure that's going to come up in the trial that we're, we're looking at seeing now because the video was leaked of hotel footage where a crime was being committed of domestic abuse and assault and it just had gone away for some reason, rumored to have been paid off. For the people to the hotel to not disclose it how's that going to tie in and do we still have mirror tunnel vision on the one person who did the one thing in the video or do we widen the lens to understand the more systemic more the more pervasive issues of how what did it say it was said really well up here um systems that high value profit over justice is it a financial issue or is it a societal is a fundamental issue that financial gain and profit is the cause of all of these side um, plots that are playing out where we see injustice in all of these different systems. And then would that then go back to a larger thing where there was a time where that profit is king motive originated when the value of that currency was created, um, was then taken away from, you know, the standard, which was, hey, I have this, I want to trade value for value. Now it's about accumulating this thing and then just printing it up of nowhere. That gives an advantage to the ones who are able to print it and to make set the tone and then everybody else is out here desperately clamoring and trying to get it to where now people's moral compass is skewed to where they can witness a crime and then be paid off by someone to stay quiet on an issue but they've just got to collect this thing you see how like there's these webs where this stuff is actually intricately in, in, connected into other things and it's about systemic issues and the root of those issues is what we need to address rather than all of these like little tiny hacks again at symptoms Addressing the symptom is still a less important, but here we go. Trial and outcome. Yes, yeah, so we can't discredit the character 
if we focus on discrediting the character, this is a common defense. And if we see that again in the trial to come, then we know that this has been done before. This is a thing. Hey, why was that person at that party? What were they doing? Were they willing to try and go get ahead? Did they, were they complicit in the matter? Did they give their consent because they were there and they were, you know, they wanted the role, they accepted this, not the other thing. When we get focused again on that stuff, a lot of the times we shift the argument in a direction that causes more injustice down the line because we are not we're not really caring about the larger social impact that goes on. Okay, that means that you're saying that there is a realm of possibility where certain people's desire to covet this thing that tells them that it's going to help them get ahead in life because this is what we created as the foundation for our lives and as our God in this creation, this society that we created. And then when a person does something in order to get that in whatever way they know how to do, now they're being victimized or brutalized in some way or some kind of injustice that they're suffering. And we're saying, okay, that was their choice to do that. But in a larger scope, we have to say, you know, what's the root cause of that again? Is it this, this currency game that we're playing? And what is the source of that? And who are the arbitrators, the orchestrators, the, the, the puppet masters of that? And was it done way back, larger before all of these other things started to, to trickle down? And is it responsible for certain things like corporate uh, decisions and corners that are cut that cause injustices and suffering and, you know, like different luxury brands and stuff that are having horrible practices and, and um, taking advantage of different, you know, sweatshops, things like that, all that stuff where they're trying to use profit as the almighty, the end all be all. And they're sacrificing a lot of humane practices and things like that. Like, is it all connected to something else? And when are we going to address those things? Again, all of this doesn't neatly wrap up, but this is just like my mind is just kind of going into all of these lanes. And then I see the, the issue of where we should be talking about these things, where we should be able to discuss, you know, where the future is going to take us in this next four year cycle and how we can talk about who's going to help us to get there and, and what are we going to do to hold that person accountable for having done that? Or what have they said on their platform that addresses these things that are impacting us today or that have been impacting us for the last 51 years, 100 and something years. We're not even able to do that because we're being silenced by this craze and this frenzy that's being media pushed that's saying like, this is the ultimate, this is the end all be all. If we don't change this, if our person doesn't win, if we don't win this game, if we don't get there on this day, that countdown that we saw before, everything is gonna fall apart. So you need to get mad, you need to get angry, you need to go into the streets, you need to write, you need to paint your face that color and you need to bleed that color through and through and you need to prove it like your life depends on it and like your self-worth depends on it and like your whole everything is online on this thing and it's just like that's just not the case that's just really trying to perpetuate an outcome that's really has nothing to do with what this is about this is about civil the addressing of civil issues in a calm mature adult manner and this is not just a game this is lives at stake and, and, and we need to do it in a way that's going to actually lead to the outcome that we want. And that's not by treating it like it's a sports game and not allowing people to have different opinions or discourse or discuss why they think X or Y and not lumping them into a category because they might question something under the umbrella of A or B. Like that's what this is supposed to be about. And if we get to a place where we're not allowed to do that and we're not safe to do that within our own circles, within our own, you know, uh, in our own workplace, in our own families, in our own friendships, then that's the, that's a deeper issue than like all this other stuff. Because now we're getting to a really crazy place where the dictatorship and the control and the dominance of, of how people are policing each other is far worse than the threat of one candidate getting in office and doing that. Because I have a feeling that if that were to ever happen, there's enough people here that aren't OK with that, that wouldn't let that fly. But what we're seeing is the reverse, where people are policing each other and and like like creating this crazy control structure and this dictatorship like that's man-made and enforced. Like if you're afraid to speak out, if you're afraid to question something, if you're afraid to represent or wear something that represents what you believe in because it goes against the, the state or the common, you know, the populace or whatever, and the people are going to do this and the Karens are going to come out and you're going to just get ran. Like, I think that's the, what we need to look at what we're doing. We the people. In order to form a more perfect union. Okay, so trial and outcome. Arbuckle faced three trials again, and he was acquitted. There were two hung juries reflecting deep divisions in public opinion regarding his guilt. His guilt. I think the same thing when I was researching the Menendez trials. The first, they had two trials. The first was a hung jury, and the second one, they were sentenced to life in prison. And now there's some sort of a petition to have their sentence reassessed. 
And it's just, it's, it's very interesting. But again, the reason they're wanting to retrial is try it is because they're wanting to look at the bigger picture or what else other factors were involved. And it stems back to this father and his actions and what he did to them to cause them to do the thing. But again, it's like, hey, they still did the thing in like upside down world of society where it's like, we're supposed to be like, oh no, the crime, you know, does it fit? Like, were you justified in causing the crime? It's like, are we okay to cause a riot after we our team doesn't win and, and cause all this damage and destruction and, and like have a concert, like what happened at the Travis Scott, I think, whatever, and cause a riot and get everybody some sense and then lives are lost. And it's like, what are we? The adults are too emotional. That's the issue. We need to dial it back. We need to mature. So I'm going to learn. We're going to learn from ChatGPT what we should do in order to do that. So again, yada, yada, yada. I asked about if there's video evidence, would it have helped to overcome the prevailing power dynamics of the open secret of exploitation in Hollywood. It talked about having concrete evidence and increased accountability, public opinion, encouraging other victims to speak out. This was very interesting and in what we're about to see and what we see happening now. Having visible proof of misconduct could embolden other victims of abuse within the industry to come forward, challenging the silence and stigma that often surrounded allegations of sexual exploitation. This could help catalyze a broader cultural shift, making it harder for powerful figures to exploit their positions without repercussions. Yada, yada, yada. If victims of sexual assault at industry parties were made to sign NDAs, would they be subject to legal action for speaking out on the crimes committed against them? This is just something I've just been so annoyed by. And like, I was like, this is what more people need to know because I feel like a lot of them really do believe that if they sign an NDA, they're not allowed to, uh, like the NDAs can protect crimes. That's just not the case. That's not how it works. Non-disclosure agreements, NDAs can complicate the legal landscape for victims of sexual assault, particularly in industries like Hollywood where such agreements are common. Here's how NDAs relate to legal action for victims speaking out about crimes committed against them. General principles of NDAs. Number one, the nature of an NDA is that it is a legal contract that restricts individuals from disclosing certain information. They are often used in various industries to protect confidential information, trade secrets, or sensitive details about business practices. This is about like competition, like to have non-competes from one business to another, like we're protecting our trade secrets, we're protecting our intellectual property, we're protecting the confidentiality of what was discussed in this meeting because we're brainstorming some product or some innovation that we're going to release. It's not so that, hey, I know that I'm going to commit this crime and so I want you to sign this waiver so that whatever I do to you after I give you this drink that's laced with some other thing and, and have all the stuff that, that you can't talk about it. Where did we get skewed in that where we thought that that was a thing? It's kind of weird. Two, limitations, and this is just from the people, the victims, the people that are being oppressed are being brought in when they're young or that are being brought in when they are have access to certain things in life, finances and things like that, where they're not or they're, they're not educated in the law or they're not educated in anything. And they just come from this desperation to achieve this thing that has been coveted, that has been made our God. And then they want that. And so they're willing to do certain things and they think that they know how to handle themselves. And then they get into something that's, you know, bigger than they could have imagined. And they seem to feel forced into a submission or to compliance with this thing and they think that this thing is you know acting in accordance with the law and there's you know the law is involved in certain things like the case that we're going to see uh, but it's fascinating because that molding of the certain type of mindset and that victim and that power dynamic has created this kind of illusion where people feel that there's actually protection for these crimes but that's not the case though and we need to as a public support those victims in, in understanding that that's not how these things were meant to be used that's not how they should be being used and that's not uh this isn't these aren't these aren't tools to protect crimes that's never been the case these these, these are business tools business contracts and i know there's big lawyers that we're talking about in this case that were you know put in place to create these ndas and i think it would be very fascinating to have a study of these ndas and to see what they're actually comprised of because a lot of cases these victims are signing these things and then never seeing them again. They're not even getting a copy of what they're signing. And so it could be like, who knows what they could be signing. And again, that has a factor in it too. In the law, there is also a concept of signing something under duress. And that factors into the validity of the legality of the contract as well. When you're forced into signing something uh, where you think that you are going to be threatened and your life is at stake or some of your safety is at stake or different certain circumstances under stress or whatever the case may be where you sign something under duress and it becomes invalid in the name of the law. These are things that also should be more known and people need to be educated on this, especially the people that are in this situation, in, a, in this industry where these agreements are very common. It's it's really important. These people, I feel like, need a lot of help and hope that's to, that's coming. 
Limitations of NDAs. While NDAs can prevent individuals from discussing specific topics, they cannot enforce silence on illegal activities, such as sexual assault or harassment. Most jurisdictions recognize that contracts cannot be used to cover up illegal actions. Let that be known. Um, legal implications for victims. Validity of NDAs in cases of criminal activity. NDAs are generally not enforceable when they attempt to silence individuals about illegal acts. Courts may consider them void if they seek to cover up criminal behavior. Victims can argue that NDAs should not apply in cases involving assault, harassment, or other crimes. Whistleblower protections. In some jurisdictions, there are laws that protect individuals who report illegal activities like sexual assault from retaliation, including legal action for breach of contract related to NDAs. These laws aim to encourage reporting and provide a safeguard for victims. Potential legal NDA consequences, because of course we do know that this is how they're being used mostly right now with this industry, is through threat of lawsuits and intimidation tactics. This is what's causing this big bubble that we're seeing that is, in my mind, soon to burst, is that victims may have legal ground to speak out despite signing an NDA can still lead to significant legal risks, including threat of lawsuits. The entity that enforced the NDA could sue the victim for a breach of contract, which could lead to legal expenses and complications, even if the victim has a strong case for arguing the NDA is invalid. Intimidation tactics. Victims may face pressure or intimidation from those enforcing the NDA, which can discourage them from speaking out. But a lot of this is part of that psychological threat of intimidation and the threat of lawsuits. But a lot of times in these cases, if they were to go to court to enforce the breach of contract of their NDA, they would be called to furnish that document and to also discuss the circumstances of the victim's claims, which would actually, in a lot of cases, expose the behavior or the conduct that they're trying to protect by the NDA. And then we go back to the idea of looking at the actual nature of an NDA, what they are meant to protect, and the misuse under that case. So a lot of times this threat and this intimidation is really just a shadow monster that really behind the curtain is the truth that if they brought these these cases to the courts, they're really going to be exposing themselves and what they're trying to protect in the first place. So it's a, it's a really... I feel like a lot of people just need more education on how those these these NDAs are not really protecting criminal activity. That's not how they're supposed to be used. Changing legal landscape, increased awareness and support movements like Me Too have heightened awareness of these issues and led to increased scrutiny of NDAs in cases of sexual misconduct. Many advocates and legal experts are pushing for changes. This is what needs to happen in the law to limit the enforceability of NDAs in sexual assault cases. So this is happening within the last, you know, five years. Uh, we've seen a lot happening that is helping us to where we were in 1920 when the first case of this happened to where we are now in 2024, where we're about to be looking at another yet another large case. And I, and I would be very interested to see how this plays out because of what we know now and where we are now in terms of also being educated on how this sexual assault and this, this industry stuff is impacting men and women and how pervasive the issue is and, and how it's being used and how it's being tied into larger crimes and drug use and um, weapon use of assault weapons and, and things like this and this kind of criminal behavior being rampant within an industry to create this sort of bubble of protection for criminal activity when these it has nothing to do with the industry has nothing to do with the nature of the job and it's like we're gonna have to start making these people stick to the job description sidelining it into having these nda parties and, and being this you know orgy orchestrator or whatever that doesn't that needs to be not a part of getting the people music so let's figure out how we cannot have these corporations and these industries and these uh, executives and these teams supporting the behavior that is causing, you know, this really bad outcome in society. And like society, just look at that. What kind of image also is the entertainment industry projecting? It's projecting this party culture, this, this, this certain society, all this stuff. It's all connected. And we need to look at that. Um, I need to move on because this is getting long. But Yeah. While NDAs can create significant hurdles for victims of, assa of assault, they cannot legally prevent individuals from speaking out about crimes committed against them, particularly when those crimes are legal. Victims should consult legal counsel to understand their rights and the potential implications of an NDA before deciding to speak out again. And when they do that and they realize first and foremost that they weren't, weren't uh, provided a copy of that NDA, then that could also be a, a strength to their case because there might be, I think, in contract law, there is a minimum one of the factors should be agreement, mutual agreement on something. And if a person isn't given the time to examine the contract that they're agreeing to, that 
would be a, an issue in upholding the validity of that original contract. So as societal attitudes evolve and legal frameworks adapt, the protection of victims' rights continues to be a critical issue in the conversation around sexual assault and exploitation. Based on the answer, let's wrap this up, above about how children should accept losses gracefully, how should adults handle the loss of their desired presidential candidates after an election? Handling the loss of a desired presidential candidate can be challenging for adults, especially when emotions run high during elections. Here are some constructive ways adults can cope with this experience. One, acknowledge emotions. Allow yourself to feel. Remember, this is how, this is based on the advice that we're giving to children. This is what we need to do as adults after the end of this countdown here that we're seeing. Acknowledge emotions. Allow yourself to feel. It's natural to feel disappointment, frustration, or even anger after an election loss. Acknowledge these emotions rather than suppressing them. Express your feelings. Talk to your friends or family about how you feel. Sharing your thoughts can help validate your emotions and provide support. Again, that's why we need to not be having this crazy, heinous uh, family and friendship shattering allegiance, like a, like a sports team taken to the extreme. Like, if you're not on my team, I can't talk to you. This is how we should maturely be able to handle this. We should be able to talk to our friends and our family about how we feel. We should be able to share our thoughts and we should be able to get support when we are trying to understand and navigate decisions of how we elect our highest office in order to shape the laws and regulations and policies that make us feel safe and free and thriving. That's what this is about at the end of the day. Let go of all the drama and the anger. Relax. I think that's one of the major things here we're going to get to a little bit later. Um, reflect on the process. Review the campaign. This is a great one. Reflect on the process. If the outcome isn't what we want or what you want, reflect on the process. Review the campaign. Consider what aspects of the campaign resonated with you and why you supported that candidate. Reflecting can help you understand your values and priorities better. Analyze the outcome. Try to understand why your candidate lost. Look at factors such as voter turnout. Voter turnout. We have to do something, right? Key issues and the overall political landscape. Overall political landscape. This can provide valuable insights for future involvement. Engage constructively. And this is another thing too, voter turnout. If, if turnout like amps up because of the sensitivity of, you know, the Roe v. Wade circumstance, that's one thing. If it's amped up because of, you know, candidates targeting or, or really trying to bring out a star-studded cast and do concerts to try and engage the new, the newly eligible voter population to come out because, you know, the campaign offered a great concert and we focused on that. Is that something that we need to look at as a society? Is it that the, the process might even be manipulated by the idea of looking at the populace and thinking about their mental, where they're at mentally and how that can shift the outcome of our nation? I think that's a huge other thing to think about and would be very interesting to see in the outcome of this if that were the case. Because in my mind, I really am not looking for my candidate to have buddies in the industry. Like that's not a criteria for me. Um, and, and holding a good concert or being able to wrap lines of lose yourself is not what makes me feel like the decisions are going to be made to create the outcomes that I want to see. Because again, like we talked about with this whole thing with the casting couch and what the issues in Hollywood and the entertainment industry, I would more so like to see the candidate who's willing to discuss those issues and that pervasive um, concern that's going on and what these uh, celebrities are going through and being exposed to, what they've had to deal with, how we're going to help them, how to advocate for them to have a safer industry to work in, and how to make decisions that, you know, will impact society based on the art that has been created and released to the public that's creating the societal norms that say that we can accept some of this pervasive sex culture and orgy culture and all these things, like what, what kind of values and things is are being uh, imposed upon us based on the entertainment industry, like maybe, maybe have that discussed at the candidate rally, but that's just my personal opinion. And I think that maybe in the future that will happen. But again, one of the things that we're gonna have to analyze as adults is to understand again, why our candidate lost. We need to look at the factors like voter turnout and the overall political landscape. And if it turns out that it's not something that we agree with or support, like we're gonna need, we're gonna, need to get in the conversation about, have conversations about that and not again, paint our, our faces a certain way and pull out the pitchforks and run out to the streets and have a sports riot afterwards because this isn't a game. And that's not what this is about. So as much as media is trying to push that outcome, hopefully we take a, AI's advice instead and continue on with step three. Engage constructively. Get involved locally. Shift your focus from the national stage to local politics or community issues. Volunteer for local candidates or causes that align with your values. Advocate for change. Use the energy from your disappointment. 
oh, wow, AI, use the energy from your disappointment to advocate for policies or issues you care about. Writing letters, attending town halls, or engaging grassroots organizing can channel your feelings into positive action. How many of us would have thought about doing this afterwards? I certainly, I'm honest, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought of doing that, but maybe I might. If, if I don't like the outcome, I'm going to use the energy from my disappointment to, to actually make constructive change. I'm not going to run out to the streets. I'm not going to join any riots. I'm not going to uh, react immaturely. I'm going to take the advice that we give to babes and to focus on the future and again have a long view right here so this is another one practice patience and perspective take a long view remember that political landscapes change over time in fact it's going to change in four years again one election loss does not define the future this is something that a lot of adults need to hear right now many opportunities will arise to support candidates who align with your beliefs know that take a deep breath right that's what it said to the children take a deep breath Focus on progress. Consider the progress that has been made on issues you care about, even if your candidate didn't win. Again, that's why I said looking at these cases that are coming up, these court cases, the trials that are being put up for, you know, resentencing and all that stuff. Paying attention to that stuff is also going to be hugely important in, in my mind and focusing on progress. Getting in a reader's group and, and discussing things like this that have been, you know, that we didn't understand because we thought, you know, the money system is made. Another thing Edward Griffin says is like the financial system is made to sound perplexing and boggling and, and to complicated to understand on purpose. And so if we listen to someone who can break it down for us and make it a lot simpler and also explain the origins of that, then we can kind of get into the conversation. Whereas before we thought we were just, you know, I can't do it because I'm not a financier. I'm not, I can't do it because I haven't studied the economic system and all that stuff. But hey, you read this this book, I guarantee you will feel a, a lot more informed and uh, capable of engaging in that conversation. So it's, it, uh, yeah, there's, there's hope in that. Foster healthy discussions. Did I read this one? Um, focus on progress. Consider the progress that has been made on issues you care about. Yes, watch the cases that are coming. Get involved in conversations. Educate yourself on on the the, the issues so that you can get in the, in the conversation more on a grassroots level in your local community. All of that good stuff with your friends and family. Have serious conversations. Have supportive conversations. Handle this maturely. Look at it as the next four years, and then act accordingly even if your candidate didn't win. Celebrate successes and contributions from various movements or candidates. Five, foster healthy discussions. Engage in dialogue. Seek out conversations with those who may have different political views. This should be happening. It shouldn't be the pitchfork mob mentality. Listening and understanding other perspectives can broaden your own and foster constructive discourse. That's what it's all about. Avoid polarization. Thank you, AI. Resist the urge to isolate yourself in like-minded groups. Engaging with diverse viewpoints can lead to richer discussions and potential common ground. Absolutely. Take care of yourself. Limit media consumption and focus on well-being from the mouths of computers. This is groundbreaking, right? This is amazing. If election coverage and social media are causing distress, consider taking breaks or limiting exposure to political news. Engage in activities that promote mental and emotional well-being, such as exercise, hobbies, or spending time with loved ones. Consider future involvement. Educate yourself and prepare for future elections. 100%. This is the ultimate right here. Use this time to learn more about political processes, candidates, and issues. Knowledge can empower you to make more informed decisions in the future. Plan for future elections by researching candidates, engaging in discussions, and encouraging others to participate in the political process. By adopting these strategies, adults can handle the loss of a desired presidential candidate in a healthy and constructive manner, fostering resilience and a commitment to civic engagement in the future. Let me give that a thumbs up. Thank you, ChatGPT. Stop sharing. Oh, really quickly. Yeah, let's take a look at there's this article I'll post um, in the comments. Should that be helpful? It is from the Liberator, examining the dangerous behavior of sports fans. I just thought this was pretty fascinating because it talks about, this was written by Annabelle Andre and Sanwi Sarode or Sarode in August of 2022, talking about, you know, several articles, New York Times, Washington Post, Harvard University study, all this stuff about how different, like the riots after the, Fans after the 1984 World Series and the Detroit Tiger Tigers victory over the San Diego Padres, fans of the Tigers rioted in celebration of their win. So people, you know, they might cause riots for a win or for a loss. According to the Baltimore Sun, what started as a small group of fans outside the Tiger Stadium grew to a massive crowd of over 50,000 people that began to engage in destructive behavior, overturning cars and hurling bottles or rocks at fellow members. One person was found dead, 80 were injured. Talks about mental and public health as a result of this. After we saw, you know, the results of the COVID epidemic and, and all pandemic and all that stuff when we were talking about public health as an ultimate. But we see our officials right now that are inciting this kind of riotous uh, 
mentality and this us versus them mentality, I think there's, they should also be maintaining and prioritizing public health and we should be not be engaging in such polarized rhetoric that's going to cause this riotous behavior. Um, again, it says here that once in a mob, sports riots are brought on by behavioral changes that occur once one becomes part of a mob. Once in a mob, people take on the behaviors of other people around them, known as mob mentality, which continues to build as more people join the group. It's fascinating. We need to make sure we don't turn our highest office and election into a mob mentality and the cause for riots. The question of whether the deleterious nature of these riots are truly justified have been debated amongst the public. The Daily Trojan stated that fans shouldn't be blamed for riots that start off as celebrations and eventually go awry, as they believe fans should have the right to celebrate or protest a team's loss or win. Maybe. But let's go on. They also point out that when similar behavior is initiated by political protesters or over sports protesters, less people tend to oppose them. I don't think so. I think when we move towards the state where we see like this going on, sports riots, the outcome fires, craziness, mob mentality. They're just holding cups in their hands of alcohol versus political riots. We see the same thing, people holding flags, megaphones and stuff, but we're still seeing fires, police activity, pain, suffering. It's it's not that different. We should still handle things the way ChatGPT suggests, like mature adults taking the advice that we give to babes. Opponents to sports riots believe that as soon as fans become a danger to the public or in other cases engage with the players or the team, the fan base has gone too far. They believe that riots such as the Philadelphia riot following the Eagles victory over the Patriots in the 2018 Super Bowl, which resulted in vandalized buildings and fires across the city, should be condemned. Another thing that says that domestic violence increases around these times, which is one of the things that I wanted to say. Public safety and mental health should always be a priority. Absolutely. Um, I think it's actually in the first paragraph or something like this, the second. Here's what it said. Once a fan becomes loyal to a team, researchers from Harvard University and other acclaimed colleges have found that fans tend to feel as if it's their duty to celebrate or protest on the team's behalf after an intense game, similar to how one feels the need to defend their own family. These researchers have also found that sports riots take place due to the tendency of fans to associate their own self-worth with the performance of the team they support, as stated by the Washington Post. As a result of this personalization, the team becomes an extension of the fan. So when a fan-supported team loses, it feels like an attack on themselves. I think that's a hugely important thing of this, that we need to make sure that as adults, we recognize that based on the results of a political campaign and election that's going to last four years, we need not tie it in so closely as an attack on ourselves. It is not a demonstration or an or a indictment against our self-worth. We are not defending our family by being, you know, so riotous and so zealous and so heinous in our, in our defense of a side of a political spectrum that we contribute to what's being shaped up as a mob mentality. We need to be a little bit more adherent of the potential for that and the re repercussions of that. And if we don't want to see what we've seen in the streets in the past that have caused cost people their lives and cost uh, people to lose members of their family and, and lose friends, I think that we should actually dial back from what this media craze is starting to stir up and this whole so-and-so is dangerous to us and the future of this is going to end and we're not going to have a country. Like all that rhetoric needs to be examined closely and they need to be looked at. And these people who are upholding our public, you know, structure and, and making us, you know, adhere to certain policies and laws in the face of a pandemic that are about the public safety and the public safety and the mental health being, you know, so important. I think these people need to consider what they're saying and what they're pushing out into the in society that creates all of this fervor and this angst that is creating all of this, you know, pressure and that might result in people running out trying to shoot people who are basically just applying for a job for the next four years. It's not even a career at this point. You're applying for a job for the next four years. And because someone doesn't like what you stand for or who you are based on what the media is saying, they feel empowered or emboldened to go out with a weapon and take your life. This is being perpetuated by the, the way that we're talking about these things in absolutes and like this is the end all be all and like this is like so horrible and like we can't handle it like a mature adults. But yet our AI system has given a beautiful like seven step strategic outline of how we should handle the very unfortunate, disappointing circumstance that might take place. It's a 50% chance that it could take place for you and for me, no matter what side we're on. There's a great seven step process that we can use to handle it maturely that doesn't involve, you know, acting like this, you know, like someone stole Christmas. <laughs> All right. So I'm done. I hope this hasn't been patronizing in any way. I hope that you see where I'm coming from and I hope that you find some inspiration to react in a way that supports 
what this really is all about is that we move forward as a society and that people move forward with using their voice to articulate the world that we want to see, the place that we want to live in, um, the people that represent what we want them to represent, how we can hold them accountable, how we can have a big picture thinking and how we can actually examine the root causes of things so that we can actually get further in the years to come and the elections to come and to not send ourselves in a complete circle on issues where we can actually move forward and see real progress because we have seen progress. And again, one of those tools and those tricks from the AI was to focus on the progress that we have seen and to focus on the good that has come from decisions that we've made as a society in the past and to know that whatever outcome we have was made by a majority um, when it comes. And so that will just be something that we need to examine, the climate that we live in and the majority view and then have healthy conversations with others so that we can better understand why the majority have that view. And maybe we can check our premises or learn something new or to experience that outcome over the next four years and then make our decision more informed based on how that comes. Because in the next four years, we might say, hey, it wasn't as bad as the media made it seem when they were trying to rally me up to become the next you know, person out there with an assault rifle on a roof trying to kill someone just because they said something that I didn't like. Let's not do that. All right. Thank you, humans, people of the earth. I'll see you in the next video. Take care. The countdown is on. If we can't ask these questions, kind of scary.